Hello, I'm coming to you today from the National Museum of the United States Army. My name is Liz Maurer, and today we're going to talk about how George Washington started the French and Indian War. Now, it has been argued that the French and Indian War was the most significant political event in 18th century North America. And in America, the conflict was between Great Britain and France over who would own and control the Ohio Valley. So that war effectively exposed the differences in goals and attitudes between Great Britain and her North American colonies. After the war, the relationship between Great Britain and the colonies would never be the same. And the events and issues that arose from the war precipitated the American Revolution. So a fire was ignited in the Pennsylvania back country in 1754. And that fire spread around the world to inflame what would become the Seven Years' War. European powers battled over who would hold the balance of power and control the Atlantic world. Now, George Washington was a pivotal figure in the French and Indian War from the very earliest days. And for Washington, the French and Indian War started in late 1753 when he was selected as the British emissary to the French frontier establishment. It ended with the fall of Fort Duquesne to the combined British and colonial forces. He was a young, ambitious man when he volunteered, and his actions, which reflected his unfortunate lack of experience, and his ambitions helped determine the course of the war. But the war was also an important event in Washington's life and development. His later decisions and actions were influenced by his French and Indian War experience. Washington's war experiences not only taught him valuable lessons about command and politics, they also caused him to re-examine his professional and personal goals. And the war both provided Washington with valuable military experience and shaped his perceptions of the relationship between the colonists and the British. So the French and British both had extensive territorial claims in North America. And when you look at this map, which is from the early 18th century, circa 1710. It's by a Dutch cartographer called Peter Schenck. It shows the territorial claims of the British, the French, and the Spanish across North and South America, as well as in the Caribbean. The North American territory is divided among the British in red, the French are in yellow, and you can see the Spanish in green. Notice who holds a lot of physical territory in North America. So the French claims were based upon 17th century explorations of the Ohio Valley and the Great Lakes region. As early as the last quarter of the 17th century and continuing into the 18th century, the French began locating forts along these important trade routes in the region. Now British claims were based upon early discovery and settlement of North America and on royal charters establishing the boundaries of some colonies like Virginia as being from sea to sea. So that means that their boundaries extended from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So by the 1740s, the French had established hegemony along the Mississippi River and were slowly asserting control to the east as well as to the west. So they're coming down and they're moving out from side to side. The British, however, were firmly ensconced on the eastern seaboard and were moving westward. So by the middle of the 18th century, the British and the French expansion were in conflict in the Trans-Appalachian West as they competed for Indian commerce. Right. The next map that we're going to look at is from 1755, and it shows the middle British colonies, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. It also shows the Iroquois Confederacy, including their places of residence their deer hunting countries, their beaver hunting countries, as well as their locations along Lake Erie, Ontario, and Champlain, and part of New France. This particular map demonstrates a detailed knowledge of and interest in these native tribes and their role in the North American balance of power. So French and British power in America was balanced on the fulcrum of the Iroquois Indian Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy consisted of the five nations, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Senecas. 
an Iroquois power was based primarily in Upper New York State, and it ran down through Pennsylvania. And it was through alliances with and domination over other Indian tribes that the Iroquois controlled territory as far away as the Great Lakes. So the Iroquois negotiated alliances with both the French and the British in order to maintain this regional suzerainty and play one European group off against the other. In 1744, the Iroquois signed the Treaty of Lancaster with the British, which ceded Iroquois claims in Maryland and Virginia. And while the Iroquois assumed that meant that the Shenandoah Valley and the land already within settled colonial boundaries, the British had a very different idea. They interpreted it as the entire area of English claim. So in this 1721 map, you can see the land boundaries and that settlement effectively ended at the Blue Ridge before the treaty. But in 1745, the Virginia House of Burgesses began granting Western land to Virginia-based land companies, including the Ohio Company. Now, the Ohio Company was one of several land companies that received land grants with the stipulation that they encouraged settlement. The Ohio Company's investors were drawn from families in the northern neck of Virginia. Thomas Lee, the Mercers, George Mason, and Lawrence Washington, along with his younger brother, George. So the Ohio Company employed frontiersman Christopher Gist to explore this territory in 1750 and 51, 1751 and 52, and 1753 and 54. The company built a fortified storehouse at Redstone Creek in late 1753 and early 1754. So Virginians had established a toehold in the West. Officials in both New France and colonial America complained to their respective home governments about foreign intrusion, and both governments approved measures to guard against that encroachment. In 1752, France sent the Marquis de Duquesne to be the Governor General of Canada and to command French forces in North America. Throughout the rest of 1752 and into early 1753, the French built strategically located forts throughout the Ohio Valley to protect their claims. The Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Robert Dinwiddie, was particularly vocal in calling upon the British government through the Privy Council to stop French incursions into the Ohio Valley. So Dinwiddie had a significant financial interest in the Ohio Company and may have seen his investments threatened. So the Privy Council agreed to give the colonial governors the power to resist French incursions in America. King George II's instructions stated specifically that the governor was to erect forts, protect English claims, and remove any Indians or Europeans from English territory. He authorized Dinwiddie to ask the House of Burgesses for money and to raise a militia. However, because Dinwiddie was feuding with the Burgesses who refused to vote the funds for an armed expedition against the French, he decided to send an emissary instead. So George Washington may have heard about the expedition from his neighbor and patron, Colonel William Fairfax. And in October of 1753, Washington traveled to Williamsburg to present himself to Dinwiddie and to volunteer to be Britain's emissary to the French. Washington was not explicit as to why he was willing to take on this assignment, but he may have hoped to ingratiate himself with the governor with the intention of furthering his military career by succeeding to the Northern Adjutancy. So Dinwiddie accepts Washington's services, perhaps because of his connections to the Ohio Company. The adjutant's role was to instruct militia officers and soldiers in the use and exercise of their arms, to increase discipline in the militia, and to teach the men of the lower classes how to be more civilized. The colonial government divided the colony into four military districts. Washington lobbied for the adjutancy of the Northern Neck, which included his home. However, Washington was appointed instead to the adjutancy of the Southern District, which stretched from the James River down to the North Carolina border. And while he was disappointed not to receive the district closer to where he lived, 
it was still an honor for the not yet 21 year old Washington, who had, by the way, no military experience, to be appointed to the adjutancy with its 100 pounds per year salary and a Virginia major's commission. So Dinwiddie instructs Washington to travel to Wills Creek, which is now Cumberland, Maryland, where the Ohio Company's fortified storehouse was located, and hire Christopher Gist as a guide. So from there, he was to hire porters and proceed to Logstown, which was an Indian settlement. At Logstown, Washington was to determine where the French forces were posted, request an Indian escort, and proceed to the French forts in the Ohio River Valley. Dinwiddie instructed Washington, once he arrived at the French fort, to present his letter from the governor, wait for a reply, and request a French escort back to the Virginia settlements. While waiting at the fort, he was told to note troop strength, armaments, defenses, communications, and to learn really all he could about the French plans in the region. So Washington sets out from Williamsburg in October 1753. He stopped at Fredericksburg and then at Alexandria before proceeding to Wills Creek. He hired porters and translators along the way, and then after picking up Gist, his first official stop was at Logstown, where he met with a potential Indian ally. And you can see Logstown on this map. The Mingos, the Shawnee, and the Delaware, who lived in the Ohio Valley, were client allies of the Iroquois Confederacy. So the Iroquois Council appointed these resident village headmen within the subject tribes in the Ohio Valley. These half-kings, as they were called, had the authority to give and receive diplomatic gifts on behalf of the Confederacy, but they did not have the authority to make independent treaties. The half-king at Logstown was an adopted Seneca named Tanagrisson, most commonly referred to by colonial Virginians as half-king. So when Washington arrived at Logstown, he presented gifts and he tried to convince Tanagrisson to join an alliance with the British. Tanagrisson seemed eager to ally with the British as he had his own grievances with the French, and he would accompany Washington through most of the journey to follow. So Washington and his party arrived at the first French fort, Venango, on December 4th. The French had expelled a British trader named John Fraser from his trading post and were fortifying Fraser's buildings into a fort. The commander of that fort, Captain Philip Thomas Jean Care, greeted Washington very cordially but refused to accept his letter. He insisted that Washington travel to the French senior commander at Fort Le Bouffe. So the party then travels on to Fort Le Bouffe where they met with Captain Jacques Legardier de Saint-Pierre, the regional commander. So Saint-Pierre was also reluctant to accept this letter, suggesting that Washington really should present it to the governor of Canada in Quebec. So Washington refuses, and he waits for Saint-Pierre's response. As at Venango, Washington examined the fortifications. So the party soon begins to suspect that the French were trying to steal the Indians' allegiances. Saint-Pierre was much more sympathetic and accommodating, but at this point, Washington becomes convinced that the French were preparing to float a large military contingent down the river as soon as the weather allowed. So he decided that he needed to warn Dinwiddie back in Williamsburg as soon as possible. And as soon as he received Saint-Pierre's response, Washington's party left, insisting that the Indians accompany them. So the weather at this point is not at all in their favor, with snow, extreme cold. The horses and porters are not able to keep up. So Washington and Gist decide to leave the group to make their way back to Cumberland on their own. They have adventures along the way, which include being shot at by an Indian spy. They lash together a makeshift raft that falls apart in the Allegheny River after experiencing frostbite while camping overnight on an island in the middle of the river, many things happen. And when Washington will complete an approximately 1,200 mile round trip when he reports to Dinwiddie in Williamsburg on January 16, 1754. So when Washington arrives back at Williamsburg, the first thing he does is report to Dinwiddie, who orders Washington to write an account of the trip. That account 
was published by the public printer in Williamsburg. Dinwiddie's purpose was to document French aggression. That report is shared around the world. So Dinwiddie was convinced that the French fort building activity and Saint-Pierre's response were acts of aggression against Great Britain. And furthermore, he believed that the aggression was egregious enough to warrant a military response. So while the governor's council was willing to approve military action, the House of Burgesses was not. So therefore, while the House of Burgesses was out of session, the council authorized Dinwiddie to raise a force to drive the French out of the Ohio. Joshua Fry, a well-liked professor at the College of William and Mary, was commissioned colonel and appointed to lead the expedition. Washington was promoted to lieutenant colonel and ordered to raise men and prepare for the mission. So while Washington was recruiting in Alexandria, Virginia, Indian trader William Trent was raising a company of 100 frontiersmen. The frontiersman's task was to build a fort as quickly as possible at the forks of the Monongahela in order to defend against further French encroachment. Washington is dispatched to recruit a force from among the Western militia. He sets out to build a fort at the forks, but finds that the French have beaten them there. So he changes course for the fortified storehouse at Redstone Creek. It's there that Ensign Edward Ward described it later as a strong square log house with loopholes sufficient to have made a good defense with a few men and very convenient for a storehouse. This pen and ink manuscript map contains several handwritten annotations by George Washington. A note on the back in Washington's hand reads, a map of the land about Redstone and Fort Pitt given to me by Captain Crawford. Washington's annotations on the map itself indicate place names, the boundaries of large tracts of land, and the initials of their owners. The map covers the watershed of the Ohio River in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The author and date are not known, but the map appears to have been made sometime between 1758 and 1771. So Washington made camp in Great Meadows on May 24th and prepared to erect a small fort. He found the location favorable because there was a small stream for water, there's ample forage for animals, and gullies that could serve as natural trenches, and a big open field for battle. He reported to Dinwiddie that it was a charming field for an encounter, words that may come back to haunt him later. So while Washington was in camp, Scouts and traders in retreat from the French forces on the frontier stopped to report that French parties were active in the area. Washington felt that the French needed to be cut off before they could report the British strength and location back to the main force. He sent out a 75-man scouting party the morning of May 27th. That night, a messenger from Tanagrisson arrived in camp to say that Indians knew the French party's location. Washington dispatched 40 men and rendezvoused with Tanagrisson's warriors. Tanagrisson led Washington to the French camp at the bottom of a deep glen rimmed with rock. It was early in the morning and the Frenchmen were just beginning to stir. It is unclear whether one of French saw the British and Indians surrounding the Glen's Rim and shot up, or whether one of Washington's men fired down. Regardless of who began the exchange, Washington's force shooting from the top of the Glen down into the camp quickly overcame the French. Washington later reported one man dead and three wounded, while the French had suffered 14 casualties, including the expedition's leader, and Saint Joseph Coulon de Vie de Jumonville. As Washington began the process of accepting the French surrender, Tanagrisson's Indians suddenly began to kill the wounded and scalp the dead French soldiers. Washington was able to protect one of the wounded and all of the healthy prisoners. The surviving French prisoners insisted that they were an ambassadorial party and handed papers to Washington as proof. They insisted that their instructions were to find the British and order them from French territory, not unlike Washington's mission of the previous winter. The prisoners were taken back to Great Meadows, 
where Washington dismissed the idea that they were an embassy. He argued that if they were ambassadors, they would have openly approached the British encampment rather than hiding. He speculated that they were there to spy on his troops and report back. Their diplomatic papers were simply a ruse to be used if they were caught. And they were caught. So Washington returned to Great Meadows, and in the following weeks, he readies for battle. He fears that the French and Indians would attack in retribution for his earlier attack on them. He pushed his men to complete a small palisaded fort that he called Fort Necessity. He ordered them to deepen the trenches that radiated out from the fort. And in letters back to Williamsburg, he brags to Dinwiddie that the fort was strong enough not to fear the attack of 500 men. During this time, Colonel Fry unfortunately dies. And Washington was made the commander of the Virginia forces. Soon after this happens, an independent company from South Carolina under Captain James Mackey arrived at Great Meadows with 100 men. Soon after, Tangrenison's group of about 80 women, children, and a few warriors took up camp in the field outside of the fort. 200 additional Virginia troops will follow, and Washington began to plan his attack on Fort Duquesne. He and the Virginia forces left Fort Necessity on June 16th, bound for Redstone Creek. Along the way, he stopped at Gist's new settlement for a conference with the local Indian tribes. Washington hoped to convince the Delaware, the Shawnees, and the Iroquois to join his attack on the French. All of the tribes were polite but refused to join him. Word begins to trickle into Washington that the French were readying to attack the British force. It became apparent that Washington's troops did not have the energy or ability to make it all the way to Redstone Creek, so they turned back to Fort Necessity. Washington hoped that promised and very badly needed supplies would have arrived at the fort while he was gone. And once at necessity, Washington concentrated on readying the fort for a fight. The men deepened and extended the trenches and connected a trench to the water supply. They'd already cleared brush to prepare the field for battle. Washington still assumed that Fort Necessity was well located in Great Meadows. The ground was very marshy, the fort was located so that only one side had ground firm enough to support an attack. He assumed that the French would meet on the field in the traditional European way of battle. It began to rain early in the morning on July 3rd. The French troops appeared about 11 that morning and advanced in three columns. Washington ordered his men out of the fort and lined up to fight. The French fired from about 600 yards and the British took their positions in trenches, now full of rainwater, to defend the fort. When the French had advanced to within about 60 yards, they scattered to the surrounding hillsides. And you can see those hillsides in this picture. The French began an eight hour bombardment of the little fort and the exposed British soldiers. They then, from every little rising, tree, stump, stone, and bush, kept up a constant galling fire upon us," said Washington. The French broke off the attack at 8 p.m. that night and called for a parley. Washington was immediately suspicious as to why the French would want to negotiate when they were so clearly winning. He took stock of his resources. All of his horses and livestock had been killed. The powder was wet, and most of the men's guns were jammed with no hope of repair. One third of his men were either dead or wounded. Some of the men had broken into the rum supply and were rapidly getting drunk. So Washington sent his only French-speaking officers, Jacob von Braun and William Peroni, to discuss terms with the French. After several exchanges, von Braun brought back the written terms. The terms were difficult to make out. They were written in French in very bad handwriting on a piece of paper rapidly getting wet from the rain. It was dark and the British officers had only a little candlelight with which to make out the terms. No one but von Braum spoke or read French and he had poor English skills. As they understood the terms, 
the British officers were welcome to leave their fort unmolested as long as they returned the French prisoners, left the area, agreed not to come back for at least a year, and admitted to the death or loss of Jumonville. The terms seemed especially liberal and generous. Mackey and Washington signed them. It was not until the surrender document was more accurately translated and published that Washington and the British would understand that he, Washington, had admitted to assassinating an ambassador on a mission of peace. Von Braum was roundly criticized for his translation failures and for a while was even accused of treason. On July 4, 1754, Washington and all the British troops left Fort Necessity, headed for the frontier town of Winchester, Virginia to regroup. Along the way and for months afterwards, men deserted in droves. Dinwiddie was anxious for Washington to immediately recruit his regiment back to full strength and return to the field before campaign season was over in the fall. Tiring of the conflicts between colonials and regulars over who had authority over whom, Dinwiddie planned to reorganize the Virginia Regiment into independent companies commanded by captains. He hoped to appoint Virginians to regular captains' positions. Washington did not want to serve at a lower rank than before. He did not want to be a captain instead of a colonel, even if that captaincy came with a regular commission. So when offered a commission, he replied, I think the disparity between the present offer of a company and my former rank too great to expect any real satisfaction or enjoyment in a corps where I once did nor thought I had a right to command. Washington resigned his Virginia command to Dinwiddie in October 1754 and returned to private life. Washington comes back to military life in March 1755. The British sent Brigadier General Edward Braddock to Virginia with British regular soldiers to take the French stronghold of Fort Duquesne near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. General Braddock offered Washington a place in his family on this expedition. This was Washington's first opportunity to serve in a military capacity under an experienced professional officer. He had renewed hope for a regular commission, although he denied it to several correspondents. The mission was not a success. The British were badly defeated at the Monongahela River. The British regulars broke and ran under the bombardment of French and Indian bullets. Washington helped to organize the retreat. Braddock died of his wounds and Washington ordered him buried under the road that he had cut. Even though it was only July, the next in command, Colonel Thomas Dunbar, put the regulars into winter quarters. Dinwiddie, back in Williamsburg, refuses to accept that the remains of the British forces were unwilling to return to the field. He petitioned the House of Burgesses for funds and determined to send his Virginians out again. He offered Washington the command. Washington insisted on certain conditions. He wanted a military chest from which to pay expenses. He wanted to select his own officers, and he insisted on two aide-de-camp. Dinwiddie agrees. Washington sets out to establish his headquarters at Winchester, Virginia. In Winchester, Washington had a Herculean task ahead of him in recruiting and supplying troops. He spent a tremendous amount of time coordinating these efforts. He also had difficulty keeping his men in service once recruited or drafted. They deserted in large numbers. Washington wrote to the governor and members of the House of Burgesses pleading for a revision in the militia law. He decried that the laws were written so as to exempt wealthy or even middle-class men from military service. The laws were disproportionately aimed at drafting the extremely poor, men who were a charge on the community. Washington used a little log building, now the middle room of George Washington Office Museum, as a military office from September 1755 to December of 1756, while Fort Loudoun was being constructed at the north end of town. Washington planned Fort Loudoun, supervised the work, and brought in his own blacksmiths from Mount Vernon to do the ironwork. 
The fort was a redoubt with four bastions. There were 14 mounted cannon and it covered one half acre. It was made of logs filled up with earth and inside there were barracks for 450 men. A well was sunk 103 feet through solid limestone rock to supply the fort with water. Washington's mission as Virginia's commander-in-chief was to execute a strategy to maintain the Virginia frontiers. After Braddock's defeat, the colony's western borders contracted dramatically. Indians mounted attacks on frontier settlements and isolated towns. Washington said that the settlers were leaving the backcountry in droves for fear of attack. The settlers were quickly abandoning their farms and retreating to more secure areas. Virginia, along with Pennsylvania and Maryland, decided to erect and garrison a string of small frontier forts. They were meant to provide a wall of protection against Indian raids and French incursion. Then, in 1755, the British frontier strategy changed. The army in America was reorganized to undertake three major campaigns. Washington and his 1st Virginia Regiment were assigned to General John Forbes. The 2nd Virginia Regiment was constituted and raised under Colonel William Byrd III. It also was placed under Forbes. Forbes's mission was to lead an attack on Fort Duquesne. Washington and Byrd were to be line officers under Forbes' command. The question of command was finally settled when it was decided that colonial officers could only be commanded by their regular counterparts and above. This was satisfactory to Washington, although he continued to hope for a regular commission. He was not pleased with Forbes' decision to cut a new road from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, rather than take Braddock's road that started in Alexandria, Virginia. The campaign ended in November when the British forces finally took Fort Duquesne. As the British moved closer, the French commander grew more concerned about his ability to defend his post. He had few men and resources, his supply lines having been cut off a few months before when the British took Fort Frontenac. He elected to abandon his post and, on November 23rd, he ordered the magazines blown up and the fort burned down. Leading an advance group, Washington reached the smoking remains of the fort on November 24, 1758. By the time the British took Fort Duquesne without firing a shot, they had mounted a series of successful attacks on other French positions as well. The French were now losing the war. Forbes was fortunate in his timing as the colonial enlistments were due to expire at the end of November. However, November not only marked the end of many provincials' enlistments, it was also to be the end of Washington's involvement with the war. He ended his campaigns having achieved his original military goal. Washington began the war with the expedition to the French, ordering them to leave British claimed territory. He ended the war when the French were quickly losing territory and in retreat. Washington would return to Williamsburg at the end of the year and finally, permanently, resign his commission in the Virginia forces. He had successfully stood for election to the House of Burgesses that year and would take his seat in February. His proposal to the lovely widow, Martha Dandridge Custis, had been accepted and their wedding date was set for January. Washington was ready for new challenges as a legislator and a planter. The now World War would continue until 1763. The French and Indian War from 1754 to 1763 and the Seven Years War of 1756 to 1763. Governor Vaudreuil in Montreal negotiated a capitulation with General Geoffrey Amherst. French authorities surrendered Montreal to British forces in September of 1760. The war in North America officially ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris on February 10, 1763, and war in the European theater was settled by the Treaty of Hubertsburg on February 15, 1763. The British offered France the choice of surrendering either its continental North American possessions east of the Mississippi or the Caribbean islands of Guadalupe and Martinique, which had been occupied by the British. 
France chose to cede the former, but was able to negotiate the retention of St. Pierre and Miquelon, two small islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, along with fishing rights in the area. They viewed the economic value of the Caribbean islands' sugar cane to be greater and easier to defend than the furs from the continent. The French philosopher Voltaire referred to the Canada disparagingly as nothing more than a few acres of snow. The British, however, were happy to take New France as defense of their North American colonies would no longer be an issue. Spain traded Florida to Britain in order to regain Cuba, but they also gained Louisiana from France, including New Orleans, in compensation for their losses. Great Britain and Spain also agreed that navigation on the Mississippi River was to be open to vessels of all nations. King George III issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763 on October 7th, which outlined the division and administration of the newly conquered territory. This map is named an accurate map of North America, describing and distinguishing the British, Spanish, and French dominions on this great continent, according to the definitive treaty concluded at Paris 10th February 1763. Also, the West India Islands belonging to and possessed by the several European princes and states. The whole laid out down according to the latest and most authentic improvements. On this map, you can see the new political divisions extending official British dominion. However, while Britain owned territory to the Mississippi River, the settlement line remained well to the east. The proclamation line drawn along the Eastern Continental Divide from Georgia to the Pennsylvania-New York border marked the dividing line between settlement and Indian territory. It would become a line of contention between the colonists and the Crown as it prohibited westward expansion into territory already populated with British colonists. It was of great concern to Washington as that line blocked his access to lands promised to French and Indian war veterans as payment for their military service. The settlement line, as well as the massive debt incurred from the war, would prove precursors to the armed conflict between Britain and her colonies in 1775. And that, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, is how George Washington started, fought, and then ended the French and Indian War. Mm -hmm.